that I don't usually do, but I'm going to take the entire time to do it. I'm going to read you some of the passages that I have been translating and studying every word in these passages over the last couple of weeks. In answering some of the questions that you and I are being faced with today and no telling when we may be faced in a very personal way. So I beg you once again, and I'm not going to apologize for this, I'm going to put this entire congregation on the spot. You're going to have to do some studying, studying, and studying over the next several weeks or months, period. And I'm going to test you tonight without you uh, putting you on the spot and ask you, asking you personal questions. I'm just going to read the passages that I've assigned to you. And I want to show you why that I gave you some additional verses in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. There's a reason for me having done this. And before I start reading, I want to say just a little bit about 2 Timothy 2.15. Give you the translation, make every effort to present yourself approved to whom? Yourself or to others? No, to God. An unashamed workman handling, instead of saying rightly dividing the word of truth, I don't translate it that way. That's not bad, but I think there's a better translation. Handling truthfully the message of truth. Or setting forth the message of truth without distortion. To give it an interpretation. You see, I believe that we are to interpret the scriptures. We have a responsibility to do so. And it is a serious responsibility. So the interpreter, and everyone is an interpreter. As you sit there, you are an interpreter. Must handle the Word of God correctly. We realize there are extremes in combining and dividing Scripture. Discrimination for instance, between things that differ must be observed. I'm going to spend the rest of my life majoring on the majors. I was looking through the work that Juanita and I have been doing, now her typing up and so forth, and she still stays on the computer several hours every day, except Sunday. And sometimes she gets on it on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Gets on the computer on Sunday afternoon sometime. But um, we have enough material for at least 25 more books. I don't intend, I don't intend really, personally, to have them printed. Be costly. And I really feel that one on the second coming that we will be dealing with, and we'll have to shorten that before we get through, a lot. We can't put all that we're going to be giving over the next several months or a year or whatever. There is enough in print on soteriology, and that's the most important subject. First of all, theology, the science of God. I want a major on God's absolute sovereignty. God is not considered God by most religionists today. And I heard a classic example of that last night, and one of the members of our church also heard, uh, Friday night it was, that same person. Awful. Absolutely atrocious. So, majoring on magnifying God's sovereignty... Man's depravity... The salvation that God has provided for those that he has given to Christ in the covenant of redemption. 
perseverance of the saints, and our hope, of course, in the coming of the Lord. Those are the major things. <clears throat> so we must be able to distinguish between things that differ. And let me illustrate it. Distinctions must be understood in the subjects of election and reprobation. It's a must. Sheep and goats. Do you really know the difference between sheep and goats? I think most of you, hopefully all the members of the church do. Lost sheep and saved sheep. There's a difference between sheep and goats and lost sheep and saved sheep. That's not the same. Redemption and application. Atonement and reconciliation. Law and grace. Regeneration and conversion. Free will. Free grace. Faith and works. Human faith and divine faith. Being accepted and being acceptable. Vast difference. One is position, the other is condition. Israel and the assembly of Christ. Visible assembly and invisible assembly. Circumcision and baptism. Sabbath and the Lord's Day. Assembly in the kingdom. And prophecy and prediction. Just to mention a few. Big subject. Handling the Word of God correctly. That's what I'm concerned about. Open your Bibles, first of all, this evening to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm going to back up a few verses, and I'll show you why. <clears throat> Seems a little warm in here. Are you folk comfortable? I'm all right. I, I, I can take you, but I don't know if you're comfortable. I want to begin with the 38th verse, but I ask you to <clears throat> do something uh, in the study of this chapter in order to prepare for what we will be discussing. And I don't know how long it will take us to complete our discussion of this. I'm going to read it tonight, ask a few questions, and make a few comments, but I'm not going to teach it in the way that I have already prepared to teach it. I want to do what I'm doing tonight to put you on the spot, to test you, or ask you questions as we go along. What would you do with this statement? How do you interpret it? If you were asked the question, what do you do with it? Going back to verse 27 of chapter 5, <clears throat> you heard that it was said by them of old. And then in the next verse, Christ speaking, but I say, or I'm saying to you. It's a present active, I'm saying to you. That's in verse 27 and 28. That's dealing with another subject. Then look at verse 31. <clears throat> in verse 31, it was said, that's an area's passive indicative, it was said. And then look, look at verse 32, but I am saying to you. So it was said, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I am saying to you. So the Lord gives his answer, and I'm going to... I want you to do this because I want you to see what the Pharisees, what the scribes were doing. They were doing just like people today. They take a, one verse of Scripture and then they start preaching their opinions. No Bible exposition. No Bible exposition. Take a text, give their point, and then start giving their opinions. And preaching their opinions. And spend all their time on their opinions. Then look at verse 33. Again. Now notice here we have the adverb. Again. 
you heard that it was said uh, to the ancients. And then in verse 34, but I am saying to you. Now we come down because we are going to begin with verse 38. But I wanted you to observe what our Lord is doing in the last part of this Sermon on the Mount, beginning with chapter 5 of Matthew. Now let's begin with verse 38. Here's where you're going to have to dig. Here's where you're going to have to study. Here's where you're going to have to learn how to handle the Scriptures personally. Don't depend on somebody else to do it for you. You heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, I'll explain this in a moment, and a tooth for a tooth. It's a pretty good translation. Now, for is a translation of a preposition. And what preposition is it? It is on T. On T. What kind of a preposition is it? It is the ablative of exchange. Exchange. The ablative of exchange. Now, let me break it down. You heard that it was said, and I, in exchange for an I, and a tooth in exchange for a tooth. Now let's look at it again. You can translate it like this. You heard that it was said, and I in retaliation for an eye. And a tooth in retaliation for a tooth. Now what do you think about that verse? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Well, put down in your margin, or if you're taking notes tonight, I'll help you this much. I'll help you a little bit to begin with. Exodus 21, 23. Now, you studied the verse. Now, let me ask you this question. What is really presented in this statement? An eye in exchange for an eye, and a tooth in exchange for a tooth. What biblical principle is being established? Now, keep in mind, folks, I didn't intend to say this, but I'll be saying some things that I wanted to wait later, but because I want you to wrestle with it. And I, I don't like to say too much, because I want you to wrestle with it, and then I would be willing to listen to your statements, and I wouldn't mind if any man, you would not offend me if somebody would like to get up and give what you think it teaches, and if you think I'm way off base and you have something worthy uh, of being said on the subject, I'd certainly listen. We're dealing with some very, very crucial things here, very controversial. What do you think? But I want to clear the air to begin with. I have to say this. Our Lord did not condemn this. I want you to think that through. He didn't condemn it. You know what's being portrayed here? Capital punishment. I said capital punishment. Now, the question is, is capital punishment taught in the New Testament? It surely is. And I'll assure you we will cover it over the next several months. So, a sound principle is given here for civil law. I said a sound principle for civil law is given. If you don't believe it, Study Romans 13, 1 through 7. Christ does not condemn it. Let's establish that. Now let's read the verse again. And now we come to the real problem text to many. 
You heard it was said, an eye in exchange for an eye and a tooth in exchange for a tooth. But I am saying to you. Now, what is the Lord saying? Watch this. Do not resist the evil. How do you interpret that? Do not resist the evil. I want to ask you a question at this point. Are you a pacifist? Well, the pacifists use this as one of their proof texts. And there are others in the scriptures that they use. Now, do you see what we're going to be doing? Very practical, isn't it? So I'm going to take one Sunday. I gave you the juicy part this morning on eschatology. Tonight, it's just down where we all live. And butting heads with all kinds of opposition. Do not resist the evil. Now, I'll tell you what I have done. In my translation, I didn't use it, but I have in parentheses at the end of that statement I just made, the word doer, evil doer. Evil doer. Do not resist the evil doer. That's very difficult for me to just stay away from going ahead and, and discussing this. In fact, this is what I worked on all afternoon. I was backing up. And I got so intrigued in it. And all, and so I just I just worked out some things, but I'm not going to not going to give it tonight if I can keep from it. Don't get me don't get me going though. Don't don't get up and raise some questions, or you might get me stirred up, and I I just have to do it anyway. Let's read all of verse 39. How would you interpret it? You say, I'm not a pacifist. I'm not. I hope you're not. <laughs> but we'll find out. We'll find out. All right, let's go a little further. But whoever strikes you. Now watch this. On your right cheek. I wonder why the right cheek is first mentioned. There's a reason for it. Do you know what it is? Why did he say the right cheek? A reason for saying the right cheek. Turn to him also the other. That's the left cheek. Why the left? Why turn the other one? So if somebody just comes up and wham, your right cheek, you just turn and say, well, go ahead and get that one too. What does it mean, folks? Did the Lord mean what he said? Yes. Now, what's the answer to it? It's very simple. It's very simple. Now you're going to miss it if you don't follow me closely just in reading. So I'm going to tell you now, our Lord meant what he said. That is to be taken literally. You say, well, I thought you said you're not a pacifist. I'm not. Now, let me illustrate it in a way, folks, that some of you may appreciate what I'm going to do. Some of you may not. 
I'm thankful that I have never used my fist on an individual since I've been saved. But folks, there are times when I really had to get hold of myself. Are you with me? I'll give you an example. Several years ago, my wife and I were attending <clears throat> another church during a Bible conference during the week. <clears throat> so I'm going to make this very practical for you. And the preacher who was there, I didn't really know too much about his position or some things, but I went for the sake, really, we wanted to get out one evening and the pastor of the church called and asked us to come, and so my wife and I went over. And about three of the families of our church, and this has only been about, um, oh, 13, 12 or 13 years ago, <clears throat> maybe less. <clears throat> After the service, I had spoken in the fellow's church that was there speaking, and one time was enough for me. Just one time, that was enough for me. And um, I found out some things by discussing the scriptures with him that we didn't have enough in common on some real important issues. It's the same fellow I told you about this morning. Now here's the point. My wife was standing there, she had a hat on. She had her head covered for the service that night. He makes fun, and still does, but yet some of our folks are over there now. Listen to me, folks. It doesn't disturb me if you do not like what I'm doing. It doesn't disturb me, I assure you. I do what I feel I should do for the edification and the warning of God's people. However you take it, that's your business. After the service, this preacher walked up with these other families from our church present. This fellow came up and wham, he hit my wife's hat, knocked it off, and laughed at him. My wife didn't even know it. Let me tell you something, folks. If that would have been back when I was unsaved, one and I just married, and I was unsaved and a man had treated my, life, my wife like that, I'll guarantee you, he would have gotten a punch in his nose. Now, I didn't do it. it. made me very angry. I had very little respect for him and still do. What would you think about me if you men, now I'm talking about you men, that doesn't mean that you would hit me, but you would certainly, you would certainly lose all respect for me, wouldn't you? To treat your wife like that? My wife was almost in tears. I wanted to take that fellow. He's bigger than I am, but that didn't make a difference to me. Boy, I tell you, that, that got me. Now, somebody hits you on one side on the right cheek, turn the other. Our Lord is using this in a literal way, but you've got to see what he's talking about. So don't run off on any tangents. It doesn't mean that you are a... See what I'm doing? I'm already... I'm just explaining the whole thing. And I don't want to repeat myself several times, so I guess I'll just give this part of it tonight, and we'll get to the rest of it later. But let's look now. So the purpose... What's the purpose... No way in the world and get around it, I guess. What's the purpose of capital punishment? And that's what he set forth in verse, without condemning it, in verse 38. But he says, I'm saying to you, there's something more than law. With law, I've got to say this, with law there is grace. That doesn't mean that we're not human. 
But I'll tell you, the grace of God can restrain you. I know I've experienced it. And I do experience it. But I'm saying to you, do not resist the evil, what? Doer. But whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. Now, the purpose of capital punishment, I'm not going to go into that. What's the purpose of capital punishment? So I'm going to have to discuss this with you later. So I'm just giving you an outline. Don't even give you an outline yet. Now, the misapplication of this by the scribes is dealt with. The misapplication. The scribes were misapplying it. Now, follow me closely. What was their fault? You've got to answer that. I'm not going any further. What was wrong? What was wrong? Now, I want you to look at the verb that is used here. It's translated to oppose. It is a compound verb. For do not resist the evil. Resisting here is anti. That's the prepositional prefix. And in this sense, it means against. Against. With the verb histame. So it's a compound verb. And it is used as an aorist active infinitive of the verb Anti and histamine. So we have to stand, and that's the meaning of histamine, to stand. And when you put them together, literally this verb means to stand against. To stand against. So do not stand against the evildoer. Now, I'll go ahead and give you something else, or to oppose or resist. Now, this is negated, negated by the adverb may. So it's negated. Therefore, do not, do not stand against, do not oppose, do not resist the evil. Doer. And then he gives an example. Now let's go a little further. I, I'm not going to discuss the evil tonight. But he gives three illustrations of this. Watch this. Three illustrations. I was amazed at this. In fact, I didn't see that until this afternoon. Three illustrations. All right, let's look now at the next verse. Verse 40. So I'm, all I'm going to do is just read these next three verses to get down to another real problem text. I would say for at least 98% of church members today, and I'm talking about church members in general. Look at verse 40. And to the one desiring, take you to law. The one desiring to take you to law and take your tunic, allow him to have the outer garment also. Now that's the first illustration he uses. The first illustration. And I'm not going into these three illustrations now tonight because that would take all the time. But I want you to think about it. That's illustration number one. Now notice verse 41. And whoever shall compel you to go one mile, what are you to do? Go with him too. That's the second illustration. 
the second illustration. Now, folks, this is the Bible. Don't put your opinion on it. Interpret the Scripture in the light of all Scripture. Don't say it doesn't mean this. It must mean that. Look at it in the light of all of the Scriptures. That's the only way to handle the Word of God. Now, when you think about verse 40, and to the one desiring to take you to law, in other words, to sue you, in other words, if he's going to take your outer garment, we'll just go ahead and give him the other one too. Or the inner garment, give him the other one. What's our Lord saying to those scribes and Pharisees? There is something more than law involved here. This is an individual. I'm letting the cat out of the bag now. This is an individual thing, not, not a civil thing to be handled in court. It's the individual. And folks, when I really unfold it later, you'll see the whole thing and it'll put all of us right where we belong as Christians. Therefore, we won't do sometimes what we want to do because of the grace of God in us. We're human. And thank God that you don't do what you feel like doing sometimes. You don't do it because you have grace. You see what I'm talking about? And then if somebody compels you to go a mile, one mile, go with him too. That's acting like a Christian. You see what I'm talking about? All right, let's look at the next one. Look at verse 42. To the one asking of you a gift or asking of you Give and turn not away the one desiring to borrow from you. Now, wait a minute. You remember the Proverbs and about loaning? No contradiction if you understand what our Lord is portraying here. But you've got to consider all the verses of Scripture. Now, does that mean that everybody comes to you and slaps you on one side, you turn your left cheek and let him slap it, and if someone wants to borrow something from you, then you give him what he asked for without any question? If someone takes you to court for something that you have, and then you give him more than he's asking for? What is our Lord portraying? Grace, folks. Grace. But all this will be explained, but I want you to deal with it. I want you to deal with it. Now look at verse 42 again before we look at verse 43. Verse 42, To the one asking of you, give, and turn not away the one desiring to borrow from you. Three illustrations. Three illustrations. And our Lord used all three of them. You know, I, I do want to say something. I just, I just think I must say something, even though I, I don't want to at this time. Right cheek first. That was customary in that day. Well, I had... If you wanted to hit you, boy, he'd whack you on your right cheek. Then you turn the other. In other words, you are to permit yourself to be humiliated. And folks, you can't do that naturally. Doesn't take long to find out who the Christians are. And who the professors are, folks, doesn't mean that Christians don't get angry. 
But I guarantee if they get out of line, they recognize it and they do something about it. But people who are all, they're so self-righteous, they're always right, they never do anything wrong, I don't have any confidence in any of them. I don't care how long you have known them and I have known them. There isn't any place for self-righteousness. Absolutely no place for self-righteousness. So self, you must permit self to be humiliated. Individual. Individual. So the first illustration is evil directed against honor. The second illustration is evil directed against material goods. There are some things worth more in life than material goods. And thirdly, the third illustration is evil directed toward the waste of time. Now let's look at verse 43. We may not be able to even do any more than just read this one passage, and I wanted to read all of them tonight if I have time, but I'll certainly have to do less than what I've been doing to get you thinking the importance of the subject that we're dealing with. Now look at verse 43. The passage I assign you was verses 43 through 48. You heard that it was said, Arius passive again, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44, but I am saying to you, Love your enemies. Now I want to ask you a question. King James will not tell you this. There are two words in the Greek for love. Two Greek verbs for love. Agapao and phileo. You've heard me say many, many times that agapao is the stronger of the two, and it is. But you know, I, I was so interested in this, I had to study all the references, and there are 116 of them, agapao, and I think about 25 of the phileo. I've got it down here. I think it's 25. I'm just trusting my memory right now. What a study. Whew. What a study. Now I want to ask you the question. Love your enemies. Our Lord used the strongest verb for love. Not the weakest, but the strongest. The one that goes beyond objective, a subjective feeling. I said the one that goes beyond subjective feeling. Now you'll find that if you do any research work, in fact, most of you don't have the books to do it, but I'm sure there are enough in the library if you wanted to, you'd find them somewhere. You will find a number of positions on this that can't all be right. There are those who say there is absolutely no difference between agapao and phileo. One is a synonym of the other. I don't believe a word of it. Not a word of it. 
but you'll never see it until, and I saw it worked out, by someone who took the time to work it all out. And when you see it worked out, folks, you can't believe it either. Agapao is the stronger of the two. One is not the synonym of the other. Now I want to show you the simplicity of this. And we have some here, I know two or three of you can, can verify what I'm saying. You know enough about the Greek to do it. There is more than one word for no. There's more than one verb for no or for knowledge. I'm talking about no now, to know, the verb form. There is more than one verb meaning to see. And we could go on and mention some others. So you have to know why a particular verb is used within the context. And there are others. But I just mentioned those two. To know, gnosko is one, oida is another. One is a much stronger word than the other. More meaningful. Has a greater depth. And since that is true, with other words, why say that one, when coming to love, one is just a synonym of the other? Not a word of truth in it. Period. Now I want to ask you a question. The King James doesn't indicate this, so you wouldn't know what kind of love it is. of the King James, would you? It says love. And after all, phileo is also translated love. You want me to give an illustration of what I'm talking about? Let me give you one. I'm going to take the time with verse 43. This is very important. Love your enemies. Listen to this closely. Please don't miss this. God never used phileo, and I've looked at all the verses and I know what I'm talking about. God never used phileo in giving a command to love. He never used phileo. It wasn't appropriate. Well, you know the difference, you'll know why. He only used agapao when giving a command for you and me to love. Love one another. Love our enemies. And yet, agapao is used for loving our enemies. The same verb that we're commanded to love one another. You see, I don't, I don't get this. This is, this is really getting, yeah, I wanted it to. I wanted to get to you. I want you to be concerned about it. You and I cannot answer some very important questions unless we know this. And folks, when we know it, we can say it, we can be prepared to say it at the right time to the people who needs to hear it, regardless of whether they understand it or not. Because we're honoring God by standing up for the truth. Turn with me to John chapter 21. I want to show you the simplicity of this. I want to explain it a little bit. I may repeat myself a little later when we go into it again, but I want us to, I want us to see this. John chapter 21. Now there's some interesting things about beginning with the 15th verse when our Lord asked Peter three questions. And here again, the King James fumbles the ball, makes no distinction, no distinction 
Not a good translation at all because we have two different verbs used. Now, before we start reading, we're going to read verses 15 through 17. And before we do that, I want us to get the picture now before our Lord began to ask Peter the questions that he asked him. All of us are familiar with those questions. Go back to verse 3 of chapter 21. Simon Peter says to them, the disciples. He was very discouraged at this time. I'm going to fish. <laughs> We've all laughed about that. I'm just going to go fishing. I'm disgusted. Folks, I have felt a lot of times. I get disgusted with people sometimes. And I feel like going fishing. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And sometimes you have problems on your job and you feel like just going fishing, getting away from it. All right, so notice what Peter says. Peter says to them, I am going to fish. I am going is a present active, indicative. Then we have to fish. That's an infinity. They say to him, we are going also. With you. We're going to go with you. Now, folks, if I get up here some Sunday and I say, well, I'm going to go fishing permanently. <laughs> I hope you don't all say, well, we'll go with you. Are you listening to me? I'm trying to be practical, folks. I'm trying to get the point over. Peter was wrong. I'm not always right. Only the Pharisees always right. Are you with me? I said, only the Pharisees always right. They went forth and entered into the boat. And that night they caught what? N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Nothing. Then the Lord told them what to do, and they did have quite a catch. Now then, the time has come now for the Lord to ask Peter some questions. Keep in mind, he was a spokesman. But I'll ask you this question. Had Peter already denied Christ? You understand that? How, how many believe Peter had already denied Christ? Are you in doubt? Peter had already denied Christ. How many times had he denied him? Three times. Now, it's a little strange, isn't it? No, not at all. Our Lord's going to ask him three questions. Sound like he's just repeating himself. All right, let's begin with verse 15. So now, Peter must make a confession three times, reminding him of his denial of his Lord three times. All right, let's look at verse 15. You can begin this verse either with thus or then. I'm choosing thus. Thus, when they had eaten a meal, Jesus says to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John. Jonah is John. Now notice the question. Do you love now, don't look at your Greek for a moment. What verb do you think our Lord used for the word love here? Agapao. Agapao. All right? Do you love me more than these? These what? What have they been talking about? Must be the fish. <laughs> All the fish they caught. Do you love me more than these? And we don't have a pronoun here, so these what? Must be the fish. Notice this. He, that is Peter, says to him, Yes, Lord, you have known. Oh, what kind of verb is that? You have known. It's a perfect. It's a perfect active indicative of what? Gnosko? No. 
Oida. Oida. You have known that I love. Now let me ask you, don't look at your Greek. What verb did Peter use in his reply? You have known that I phileo you. Peter used the weaker. Why did he use the weaker? Now he knew the Lord was really interrogating him. Don't you think for a moment he didn't know that? He did. And folks, please follow me on this. Every time you read this, put yourself, as I do my best to put myself, in the shoes of Peter. If I put myself in the shoes of Peter, would I use Agapao the stronger? He was literally saying, Lord, you have known that I have affection for you. That I have affection for you. Affection. See, agapao is a stronger word. It is a word that means total dedication to. He wasn't going to use that. And folks, let's not be pharisaical and use something that we know deep down in our hearts that we're not at our best and doing our best for him. See, I didn't know I was going to do all this. In fact, I'm just, I'm just doing it. Now notice, yes, Lord, you have known that I, the verb is phileo, I have affection for you. He says to him, feed my lambs. Now this time, feed my lambs. The Lord doesn't stop there. Verse 16, he says to him again. Now, how would you feel if the Lord asked you, as he did Peter, and turned right around and asked you again the same question? He says to him again the second time, Simon, son of John, do you what? What? Agapao again. Love me. He says to him, Yes, Lord, you have known that I. What's the verb? Phileo again. I have affection for you. He says to him, Shepherd. My sheep. Folks, that's a difficult job. You can put the feed out for them, but to shepherd them. When you start shepherding the sheep and trying to get them to do the right thing, and when they're going astray, you say, don't do that. You take the hook, put it around the neck, and they kind of hurt them. Of course, today, you know, you'd be you'd be sued. I may be putting this in the ears of somebody, but if so, so be it. Did you know the way I teach and preach? Somebody gets angry at me, he could sue me and win the case in court. Now, if you want revenge because I've said something to you or I've done something to you, you know how to get it. Think it through, folks. It's a sad day in which we're living. So in the first two questions, Christ used agapao. And Peter answered with phileo. Now let's look at the last question. And what do we have here? Christ used Peter's term... 
in the third question. He used phileo, not agapao. So the Lord says, why no? Well, let's look at the verse. Verse 17. He says to him the third time. Now, most people I've had to deal with through the years, you ask them the same thing three times and they're angry. Don't you think I've got some sense? <laughs> Come on, folks. Come on. I'm watching you. I'm seeing how you're taking it. If you smile, I know you're kind of getting it in your angry. I say, uh-oh, I've touched a sore spot. He says to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It's phileo this time. Peter was grieved. Oh, what? Grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you have known. There is the perfect again. All things. You know that I love. Phileo. You know that I have affection for you. Jesus says to him, feed my it's sheep this time, not the lambs. So having denied his Lord three times, Peter must now confess that Christ's Lordship is real to him. Real to him. Humbled by the memory of his own fall. F-A-L-L. Not from grace, because he was preserved by Christ's prayer. You and I are preserved by Christ's grace, by his intercession for you and me. But humble by the fall, what did Peter use? He used a different verb in his reply. A different verb in his reply. So, is phileo a synonym of agapao? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to... I'm going to keep the rest of this information. I want to give you a breakdown. The verb, for instance, is used... 141 times and the noun form agape, that's the noun form is used 116 times when it comes to phileo phileo is used 25 times that is the verb I mean uh, phileo and then phyllis is used 29 times in the New Testament but I'll explain this more and show how that each one of these verbs is used in the study of God's Word, but I'll do that later. Now let's go back to our passage that we were reading. See, I'm not doing any more than reading the passage in Matthew. But I have some more questions I want to ask you. So what does it mean to love your enemies? I want you to see what kind of statement this is. Notice. That's a present active imperative or command. It's a command for you and me. He didn't use. He never used phileo. Always used agapao. Now I'm going to let you wrestle with that. And we'll discuss why he chose this verb. So let's read all of verse 43. You heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That isn't found anywhere in the Old Testament. So the scribes misrepresented the Scriptures. But I'm saying to you, love your enemies and pray for the ones persecuting you. That's all that you need to have in the translation of verse 44. See, you've got a lot of superfluous words here in the King James, folks. 
Now look at verse 45. In order, let's read verse 44 and then start with 45 without stopping. But I am saying to you, love your enemies and pray for the ones persecuting you in order that you may become, is this correct? Is the word children here correct? Look at, look at your Greek now. Look at your Greek in linear. Is the word children the correct translation? Nope. It's we are. We are. Sons. In order that you may become sons. Children denotes relationship. And sons denote the dignity of one's position in Christ. He's talking about maturity here, so stay with me. I'm not talking about relationship here, folks. I'm talking about maturity. May become full grown sons. Then he says, of your father in the heavens. Because he makes or he causes, watch what he's going to say now, his son to rise on the evil men and good men. And sins reign on the just men and unjust men. Verse 46, for if you may love, the ones who love you do not even the publicans do the same? And verse 47, And if you may greet only your brethren, what more are you doing? Are not even the heathen Doing the same. Now verse 48 is a very controversial verse. Therefore, I'm giving the translation, be mature as your heavenly Father is mature. So you be mature in your realm as the Father is mature in His realm. He's not talking about sinless perfection. Talking about Christian maturity. So we are to strive to be mature in our character as our Heavenly Father is in His character. Folks, this is our goal. I didn't read all the passages. A lot of questions here. Will you study that carefully, closely, please? Now, I uh, would you like me to read a few verses? I translated it. I think I don't. I didn't. I don't have that Bible with me that I translated. <clears throat> But study this in connection with Psalm 139 that I assigned to you last Sunday. We'll deal with that later. Is there a contradiction between hating them? Well, let me get this Bible and we'll look at the King James. I want to give you a translation. There is a little difference and I want to go into the Hebrew words with you in this passage. But we'll do that when we study the 139th. 139th division of the Psalms. Now, I want to warn you, if you try to tell somebody this, unless that person has a desire to listen and to search the Scriptures, folks, you'll be wasting your time. And you're not going to find very many who are willing to listen. But you're doing it for your, your good, your good. 
Uh, let's read beginning just with the 20th verse. Now let's go back to the 19th. I want us to get the connection. I'll just read the King James because I want to give the translation later when we deal with it. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. Pretty strong language, isn't it? How do, you, how do you reconcile this? Is there a contradiction between what I just gave you, what our Lord said, and with this in the Old Testament? Now look at verse 20. For they speak against thee wickedly. I want you to observe something here. We're not dealing now with individuals. It's not individual here, folks. Not individual. This gets into people's attitude of God. And folks, watch this. And I want to show you how dumb, and I, I know that's a terrible statement to make of a, quote, great theologian, end of quote. But I want to give you a statement just in a minute. And there isn't anything even in the King James translation that would justify his statement. And I'm going to give you a direct quote in just a minute. Now watch verse 20. For they speak against thee wickedly. Now David is talking. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Whew. Let me stop there a moment, inject something. I don't ever like to hear someone use the Lord's name in vain. I hear people just throw that name out, God and Lord, and when they don't mean a bit of it, it, it really does irritate me. The only time they want to use the name of the Lord or God is in jest. I get angry. I'm as angry as David expressed himself here. You say, not me, I love my enemies. Stay with me, folks. I'll get you stirred up if you're listening to long enough. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Now, I want to tell you, there are more ways than two or three to take God's name in vain. What about the religionist who talks about the great God of the universe? God created all things. God so loved us, He gave His Son. And then turn right around and say, God can't do anything until I let Him. That's taking God's name in vain. And folks, that's more damnable than the enemy using God's name in vain. I challenge anybody to refute it. Okay. Now notice verse 21. Do not I hate them? Lord, O oh Lord, that's Yahweh. That hate thee. And am not I greed with those that rise up against thee? Verse 22 is we'll stop. I hate them with perfect hatred. Folks, we're going to get into the Hebrew on perfect and hatred and love and all the rest of it. Now, I want to give you a quote. Listen to this. A direct quote of these three verses here by a quote theologian, end of quote. Quote, the hate of verse 21 is understood in the sense of their conduct. He wished to avoid their society. It is not their persons, but their works that are hated by righteous persons, end of quote. 
I don't know what the passage says, folks. All right, let's read it. Somebody lied. Who lied? Not the Bible, folks, but the person who said what I've just given you as a quote. For they... That's not talking about works, folks. That's persons. That's a pronoun that refers to persons. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies, not their works, take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, not their works, it's them. And am not I grieved with those, not works, but those that rise up against thee. I hate them, not their works, but them. What kind of hatred? With perfect hatred. Do you know what that word means? That word perfect in the Hebrew? I'll let you try to look it up between now and the time we discuss it. But I'll tell you basically what it means. The wholeness of hatred. And I've looked it up in every major Hebrew work. How do you reconcile these two passages? It is just as simple as it can be. One is what? Personal, individual. The other is judicial, dealing with Almighty God. Anytime I hear someone misuse these passages of Scripture, he can talk about his love. Oh, I love, I love my enemies. Yes, according to the command based on what our Lord said and the sense in which it is to be used. I can certainly desire their well-being. See, I'm really letting a lot out of the bag. But you, you study it. Let's stand.